uh, unity and diversity, you know, is going to come up with a whole different uh, title for my remarks because that is so used and used and overused to the point that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And then I thought, well, that's a great place to start because people tend to get hung up on the unity part. You know, how do we do this? You know, what is this? Is this possible in human society? Whereas it's actually the diversity part that gets tricky, right? We all started in unity. Humankind started as one family. That can be a religious belief or it can be a biological scientific belief. Started off as a family, became a very large extended family. And as it grew, it grew because there was support, there was care, there was nurturing there was looking out for one another. But as the population became so large that it began to expand, to develop new resources, to continue growing, continue caring for its well-being, it grew so much and so far for such a long time that populations of us would run into one another and because we had been separated by time or terrain or ocean we didn't know any longer recognize the person we were seeing as us they weren't us anymore and we're all spirit we have to wear these earth suits here on the planet but we're all spirit the body however is newer spirit has always existed body hasn't been around all that long we're pretty new animals and our biology still tells us that if something is unfamiliar something looks different that we need to be wary of it that we need to be suspicious and perhaps not allowed there to be trust until we feel satisfied that cooperation or just interaction will be safe. And that is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world when there are the concept or the reality of scarcity of resources or when the distance, the time or other factors have divided people along ideological, religious, race, differences that we feel that push us apart. So we tend to look at the differences much more than we look at the similarities. So this is one of the interesting things about the human brain. I remember reading in college that if you if everything in your life was going perfect and you're having no problems whatsoever, you would find a way to worry about whether the warranty was gonna run out on your microwave. Our brains are programmed to look for problems and they do this to keep us safe and to keep us alive. So we won't immediately see or come up against another individual that we don't know and see a head, arms, legs, mouth, <laughs> ears, nose, hair, no hair, and say to ourselves, this is one of us. We will immediately go to the differences. However, now I have to go to my notes. Ah, however, this is because emotion happens first. Chemicals come running in the body, thank you, biology, and they override the rational thinking brain. They do that again to save our lives. You don't want the first time you run into a cave bear to be the guy that's standing there analyzing how interesting this animal is. You won't survive to procreate. You want to be the guy that went and ran. <laughs> 
and, and put a river between himself and this animal. So the, the, the emotion, the chemicals happen first and we see what is an unknown before the thinking part of the brain comes in. So sometimes, and I have had this happen to me when I was a young girl and I was in the city for the first time in my elevator and I was the only person on the elevator and somebody else got on the elevator that I didn't know and he was a very large man and I got so scared that I, I got off the elevator and I went down something like 14 flights of stairs for probably absolutely no reason. But my, my biology told me that being in a soundproof box with somebody that I didn't know that was a lot larger than myself might not be a good idea. He was probably a great guy, I will never find out. But the fact that our, our thinking can catch up after it's been temporarily sidetracked by emotion is an enormous advantage because once we reach adulthood, we can get that familiar feeling and we can go, I know what that is. And we can go forward from there. Alongside all of the issues that have been going on with foreign policy and the surfacing of value systems and social identities demanding respect in the emerging new world order, there are more people than ever that are working toward integrative practices designed to improve social and economic needs in common. And for this, believe it or not, we have the pandemic to uh, give, give credit to by isolating, by being apart from, and it had its downsides. It allowed many people time that they had never had or never taken before and space for introspection away from the usual people and places and roles. Many eventually took the time to consider their values and their place in the world. It isn't surprising how much dissension we have in the world because of all the differences we have. What's amazing is how in the lockdown, the number of participants that found and joined online communities internationally exploded. Humans need to connect. And we did so by association. People who collect stamps, breed cats, love old music, old cars, study history or art or tattoos or science fiction. Everything from farming to fashion with people they likely would not have imagined connecting with if they had run into them in person first. And that's fascinating. Interconnectedness without offense to cultural identity through online exchanges has become so common as to reveal an apparent common acceptance of diversity. Without realizing it, young and old, we have forged a level of intercultural cooperation that would have been difficult to imagine just 15 years ago. The idea that peaceful coexistence is possible with the other has been accomplished by way of informal interaction and multidimensional communities characterized by their comradeship, their bloodless competition with vertical and lateral support systems. This global public has sown seeds that continue to birth cosmopolitan maturity naturally encompassing and integrating ethnic and religious identities. There is suffering, there is horror, there is urgency that's going unaddressed. To observe the ease with which these relationships bud and bloom is to recognize the viability of peaceful global communities. Any other stance is a contradiction to the reality of their consistency and exponential growth. Bridging the online world with the physical, consider research scholars, medical experts, orchestras, global industries, sports teams, etc., are made up of a variety of races, ethnicities, and faiths comfortable with and dependent upon one another. 
or gaming, whose domain began exclusively online to, through play and storytelling and morphed into merchandising and conventions. All of these relationships, I don't know how many groups you guys belong to, but I'm embarrassed to tell you how many I now belong to online. All of these relationships began without an approach grounded in politics or education or diplomacy, which all too often were utilizing veiled cultural stereotypes, which I know all too well. The identity of human civilization has demonstrated the advantages of multicultural society. Let this add even greater reason for hope. There are practices that must be redefined to incorporate the changes that now exist. And I'd like to leave you with this. Peace is a choice. I get a lot of argument about that, but I'll let you sleep on it. Peace is a choice. There is ignorance and there is fear. The pair of those are at the root of every hate group, chauvinism, and bigotry. It's important the way you deal with someone who is ignorant or someone in a state of fear. It is very different than the way you would approach and engage with someone you had labeled stupid or filled with rage. This difference is the of how we move forward here at ISERM and as a human species. And this is why we're here. This is why we're together. This is why we care. And this is why we choose to be involved.